All right. So thank you again for spending part of your very valuable time with me tonight, as, or I guess for one of us here, your morning. Um, as we kind of go through our topic today, and our topic today is protein and the building blocks of life. Uh, I'm Dr. Brett Klusko. I'm a chiropractor in the Edmonton area. I'm a second generation chiropractor, so my father's a chiropractor. So um, kind of had that, that health lifestyle is something I grew up with and I practice every single day of my life. So it's something that means a lot to me and something I promote very much. And I also try to live the lifestyle. I try not to recommend anything without having done it myself. So when it comes to things like protein, and uh, nutrition, it, it can get very squirrely. It can get really confusing, and there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, not a lot of evidence behind a lot of this stuff. And a lot of people will just kind of go off of what's worked for them, which is great. Um, but as we move into more of an evidence-based practice, uh, we we need to have more solid kind of guidelines to what we do, especially when it comes to supplementation. That world is very big and very confusing. So let's get going here. So as discussed, what we're going to do is talk about protein, the building blocks of life, all right? Now, protein is, is pretty important, but what do, you, what do you picture as protein? Is this a picture that you think of when you think of protein? Is it more meat or animal-based? Or maybe is it something more like this? Is it going to be more fruit-based or vegetable-based or, or nut-based or seed-based? Uh, or is it something in between? Is it something that you kind of have a, a, a kind of best of every world? You have some... So vegetables in there for your protein, you have some meat, you have seeds, you have eggs, um, and, and, and in between. Um, but protein is really important, and protein is actually made up of, of amino acids, and those are the building blocks of life. And these amino acids make up 20% of what makes up our body. They're really important for pretty much all processes, including the production and replication and protection of DNA. They're important for creating energy, they're important for nervous system and signals being sent to and from the brain. They're also important for healing and also very important for the immune system and shielding you from, from disease and, and, and other disorders. But it's really important and it makes up the bulk of what our muscle mass is. So amino acids, there's, there's a lot of them. In fact, it's been discovered in over, over a few hundred. There's hundreds of different amino acids within the body. And there's 22 specific ones that are focused on in humans. And of those 22, nine of them are referred to as essential amino acids. Essential amino acids are really, really important. There's nine, like I said, and it's histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine. Now, obviously, you don't need to know that these are just kind of the chemical makes up, makeups on them. You might have heard of a few of them. Tryptophan was a big one, but what makes essential amino acids essential is they cannot be made by the body. We must consume them in our diets. And foods that contain all of these essential amino acids are referred to as complete proteins. So when you ever heard that, that complete protein term, you know what that means. You know that you're getting the amino acids that your body cannot replicate, that you need to be able to make protein and have the proper function in your body to synthesize protein. So complete proteins. Uh, what is the best form of protein? There's a lot of debate on this. There's, is, it, is it going to be animal products? Is it going to be plant products? Is it going to be a combination? And the best source of protein are through high quality animal products. That is a fact. Uh, the best quality, and what I mean by that is that you get them in hopefully being wild, meaning that uh, hunters are going to have the advantage because their food quality is going to be higher, especially the meat they get. And we know that we've had wild meat, we've had deer and, and moose, and you know how good it tastes because of what it is. Uh, if you can't get that, then your be next best is making sure it's hormone-free, free-range, grass-fed, fresh, so not shipped and stored for long distances or, or processed, and chemical-free. And this list goes on about making sure our food is quality. So this will include lean meats, fish, and eggs. Dairy is another considered to be a complete protein, but there are some complications and issues with dairy. Uh, it is heavily processed in our society. It is full of chemical additives and hormones. It's designed for a completely different digestive system. Because of this, we don't digest it properly, creates issues, and it becomes very highly inflammatory in the body. Inflammation is a, is a it is, the new research is showing that it, inflammation is the root of a lot of our diseases. In fact, the majority of our diseases, ranging from things like getting colds and flus, 
to things like MS and Alzheimer's and other autoimmune disorders and even cancer and heart disease. So it, infl inflammatory foods are not good for you. You want to stay away from them. And dairy also has a very high allergenic response. So people have a lot of complications. We probably know a lot of people directly within our families or our friends that are lactose intolerant or can eat dairy because it upsets their stomach or whatever the range may be. They just don't respond properly. So it is referred to actually as a damaging form of protein. This is the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate that was released a few years back. And it kind of breaks down what we should be eating. And this has changed from my, day, my school days of like the pyramid and getting your, your basic food groups and stuff. And this is what they do now. This is what your plate should be as you're eating. And one of the very interesting things about this is in the top right, it says to limit your milk and dairy to one or two servings a day. Now that is in contrast to actually even some of the commercials I've seen. I don't know if people watch TV, but there's one out right now with like a bunch of guys playing hockey and then they're drinking milk afterwards. And I kind of laugh at that because there, it's recommended you eat mul or have multiple servings of, of milk a day, but it's not based off of fact or any research behind it. In fact, Harvard basically says limited to one or two maximum, meaning that in a lot of their circumstances, dairy isn't even recommended. So plant protein. Now, this is a fairly new area of research and knowledge. Uh, for the longest time, you'd think, okay, well, somebody that's vegan or vegetarian has a massive disadvantage. They need to have protein. They're not getting enough iron. They're going to be anemic. And all these things that came along, kind of that, that ideology of what people that just eat plants are like. Now, the new, re new research has actually been very contradictory to that. It's showing that people that have plant-based diets are actually just as good off as people with that are more carnivores, plus they actually have a bit of a step ahead. We're going to talk about why that is. Uh, plants are a great source of amino acids, but one, no one plant has, is a complete protein. It has to come in a variety of sources. The good sources, the ones that have more complete types of protein are quinoa, rice, soy, chickpeas, hemp seeds, chia seeds, and spirulina. But like I said, no one plant is a complete protein, which means that if you are vegan or vegetarian, or you've eliminated pretty much all animal products from your diet, you need to be able to eat multiple versions of these plants. And you need to eat them in, 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 in variety. So you need to have hemp seeds and quinoa and soy and all these different ones. They complement each other. And that's how you'll be able to create all the protein you need and get all those essential amino acids into your body. Soy is a topic of hot discussion. It is... Uh, for many years now, I've been kind of looked down on and, and seen as kind of a negative thing. And uh, the research that, that was based off of, that, in, in truth, is very difficult to find or doesn't even exist. Uh, I'm not too sure where this rumor had started from, but uh, the Cancer Society actually recommends multiple servings of soy every day. Uh, so for them to come out and say that, that's kind of a big deal. And we're going to talk a little bit about more why I think that happened. So soy is, a un is, is unique among plant proteins. It is the closest form of essential amino acids in the plant kingdom with the correct ratios as compared to animal sources. Now, what this means, if you were to take a, uh, a lean chicken breast and you were to eat that, what you consume is going to be in almost identical ratios as soy. So soy is literally the next closest thing you can get to an animal type protein without eating the animal. So very, very important for anybody that's vegan or vegetarian. But there's good and bad soy. And this is where I think some of the misunderstanding of soy comes from, is that a lot of our Western society, our soy is not the real soy. It's not the soy that uh, Jenna would have been consuming when she was in uh, Japan. This is not the same soy. Our soy here can be GMO. Uh, a lot of it isn't organic, so it's smothered in a lot of toxins. Uh, they alcohol wash it, and that will destroy part of the plant. Um, and they don't consume it whole. What they do is they isolate it. And they'll take bits and pieces of the bean that they want and not use the whole thing. So if you're going to consume a soy, make sure it's non-GMO. Make sure it's organic or even better than organic. It's better than that. And water washed, make sure you consume it whole. You eat the entire bean or consume the entire bean. Whole foods. This is a big part. Now, like I just talked about, isolates are not recognized by the body. Things that are pulled out and you're picking and choosing part of it, our body is not designed to, to take that in. And when it does that, the body does not recognize it, and your, your absorption rates are going to reduce greatly. You're going to have issues with that. Now, I always use this example, and I use Tums to kind of rip on it a little bit, is that uh, 
uh, in the commercials, the Tums are always promoting calcium, right? They're saying that they put a lot of calcium into the Tums, so you're getting a whole bunch of it. But the issue is, is that when you have calcium like that, um, you need to have an acidic environment within your stomach to be able to absorb it. And when you take Tums, it neutralizes that acid, meaning that the calcium that's going in, you're only absorbing about 4% of what they say you are, which means that the calcium in Tums is pretty much enough. It's, it's pretty much zip. So if you're thinking you're getting calcium from your thumbs, it is horribly wrong. And it's because it's not coming in the right way. Your body doesn't recognize it properly and it inhibits it. Absorption is maximized when the whole food is eaten. The body knows what to do with that. Our bodies were designed to eat food, not isolated parts of the food. And eating different sources of protein, as I said before, is going to increase your absorption further. This is known as food synergy. When you eat different types of things, what they will do is benefit each other back and forth. When you have eat a tomato, you get a really good source of, of a bunch of different things in the tomatoes, all the vitamin Bs that are in there, um, and, and that's some of the other important things. You eat broccoli separate, you get a lot of really good things. You get your calcium, magnesium, uh, a few other very important things that come in dark green leafy vegetables. When you eat them together, they actually coincide and work better and you absorb more. This is synergy. So eating a variety of different foods is going to be very important to get what you need to your body. But how do we measure protein absorption? This is kind of the big one, is we can sit here and say like, yeah, it's better for you, but how are we measuring that? Now, um, the term we use for, does something get into the body? Does it get into the bloodstream? Does it get to the cellular level? Does it get to the DNA level? Is referred to as bioavailability. Something with high bioavailability means that it gets to the cell. It gets right where you need it to be. Things with low bioavailability basically means that it goes into your stomach and then you just shoot it out the other end kind of. Right? So protein absorption is measured by what's called the PDC-AAS uh, scale, which is the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. Kind of a mouthful, but this rating is very simple. It's a zero to one rating. Zero being no absorption, one being the best absorption you can possibly have. So nothing gets higher than a one, nothing gets lower than a zero. Quite simple. One out of one PDC AAS uh, foods are the only whole foods on the planet that get it. One out of one are egg whites and soy. The other one out of ones are going to be isolates. They're going to be processed food. They're going to be parts of the food, not the whole thing. These are the only two that actually reach this top. So how many grams of protein should you eat? And according to Arnie, it's all of them. But is there such a thing as too much protein? And the answer is absolutely yes, there is too much thing, too much of a, of a good thing, right? So how much is too much? Uh, and a study done, I quoted it very well and worded it better than I can word it, and it states that no further protein synthetic advantage was elicited by a larger meal when compared to the response of a more moderate 30 gram protein serving as compared to a 90 gram protein serving. So basically what they're saying is that you can have 30 grams, you have 90 grams, but you're not getting any more in. Your body maxes out, it caps out, and they found it to be around, that there's a debate on this one, about 25 to 35 grams, and that will obviously depend on the person, what they're eating before, what their activity levels are, and so on and so forth. But 90 grams of protein didn't do anything better for them. And they went further to say that it may well be the case that a slightly smaller meal will produce a similar protein synthetic response. Saying that basically, if you even had 20 grams of protein, you're probably getting a better kick out of that than you were at the 90 grams. And the ideology behind that is the 90 grams is overwhelming the system, and the system goes, no, nope, no more. Shuts the door, and that's it. So you got to be careful on how much you take in. So for those of us that are supplementing, and you have your big protein containers, and it's saying like 60 grams per serving and stuff like that, you're not actually getting what they say you're getting into your system. And not only is your body not absorbing, but then you have to worry about the bioavailability. You're getting a fraction of what they say you're getting on top of the fact that your body isn't even absorbing. So there is a lot of problems and inhibitions when it comes to that. On the same study, instead of a single large protein-rich meal, ingestion of a multi multiple moderate-sized servings of high-quality protein-rich foods over the course of a day may represent an effective means of optimizing potential muscle growth while permitting greater control over total energy and nutrient intake. What that's basically saying is that if you're snacking lightly throughout the day with protein or protein-rich foods, it is going to be much better for not only getting the protein that you need into your body, but making sure you're not overwhelming your system and creating proper balance. You have a good energy versus 
getting all the, the macros and micros into your body that you need without overwhelming or damaging your system. Uh, very important. And that was uh, actually done in a PubMed article through, through uh, NCBI and the government. And very important article, I think, for understanding that there is such a thing as too much protein. And now we step into the world of, of supplementation. And this is kind of a, a rabbit hole of, of confusion. This is not an easy one at all. Um, Consumer Reports did a study in 2010, and what they did is they took a bunch of random supplements off the shelf, and they tested them to see what was in them. And what they found is the majority of them were actually uh, they're contaminated with a, a bunch of heavy metals, which was a big issue. And they, they kind of asked the question, why is that happening? And what happens because not a lot of these are tested by a third-party testing. They don't even have to answer to anybody. There is no governing board that really governs the quality of a lot of these products, meaning that they don't have to answer to anything. They, they put out their product, what they say, they, whatever they say is in it, they're allowed to say, and you consume it. And this is a big issue. We learned about this in school, and some of them are filled with a bunch of filler, and that was actually the one that came up next, is that a lot of them were tested, and they found that a lot of the protein powders had been filled with low-quality protein fillers, uh, such as isolated amino acids. And they're not considered high quality proteins. And what they did is added this to their general protein recommendation of what you're going to get, meaning that what you're actually getting is once again not what you're actually getting. You're getting a lot less and you're getting a lot less quality. So this is a big issue. You need to find something that has some sort of, of quality testing, a third party testing, which is really, really important. So let's look at the two winners for this one. If you were to look at protein and you were to look at the two best rated as the best in the PDCAS scale and the ones that are going to be best for you if you're looking to supplement or add a little bit more to your life. And we have whey on the left and soy on the right. And we'll talk about whey first. So whey protein is a byproduct of making cheese or other dairy products. Now, according to the Mayo Clinic, it, whey protein may cause abnormal heart rhythms, changes in cholesterol level, headache, increased diabetes risk, increased fracture osteoporosis risk, kidney dysfunction, liver damage, stomach or intestinal symptoms, including acid reflux, floating constipation, crowns, gas, increased bowel movements, movement problems, nausea, reduced appetite, swelling of limbs, upset stomach, and general thirst. What whey does at a cellular level is it pumps water in the muscle cell. If you know anybody that's on a really fairly heavy whey regimen and they stop, they deflate quite, fairly quickly. They're just holding on to a lot of water. And there's a lot of issues as this goes through your body. It causes a lot of damage. And it's seen, as I stated before, as an inflammatory type of protein. So this is very damaging. You get good gains out of it. It gets to your cellular level. But the damage that it causes between consuming it and where it gets to is, is a little bit concerning, a little bit scary. If you're looking for something that's more of a long term, then I definitely would say whey is not going to be your friend. We move on to soy. Soy is not a complete protein. Um, they make that, get that very clear, is that by itself, soy is not going to provide you with everything you need for your body. You're going to have to have other forms of protein in your diet. But as a vegan or a vegetarian, it is going to be the best non-animal source of protein you can get. It has the best absorption, and it has, as we stated before, almost all the essential amino acids you need in the correct ratios. But... As I also stated before, not all soy is created equal. You need to find that quality. And more research to prove the effectiveness needs to be done. There's a lot of misunderstanding and uh, kind of an odd thought process on soy. We need to make sure that we're, we're getting all the information we possibly can to make the proper decisions in our, in our lifestyle. So our Western diet. Um, this, is, this is something that I deal with day in, day out in, in talking to my patients and as I ask them questions about their lifestyle. And as in our Western diet, we base a lot of our food around a single protein source. So we have a meat, now we gotta get some sides for it, right? So we do not lack protein in our diets, we do not. We have more than enough, I assure you. But one thing we do lack across the board is fruits and vegetables. We do not eat enough of them. We're supposed to be having nine to 13 servings per day, every day of fruits and vegetables. Now, this serving amount has gone up since I was little. When I was growing up, it was three to five, and then it kind of went from it five to eight, then something like seven to 10, uh, nine to 12, or seven to 12, seven to 13, now it's nine to 13. The reason behind that is kind of, it, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, number one is that 
our food quality is diminishing greatly. It, we're we live in Canada. We we don't have long growing season. We don't grow a lot of the food and the fruits and vegetables that we eat. They're shipped from around the world. They're shipped long distances, and they're shipped before they're ripe. They're shipped before they have all the nutrients they have in it. So by the time we get to it, it's been sprayed chemically. It doesn't have the nutrient content that it should, and a lot of this stuff is just not what it should be. And I I think uh, my wife always talks about this one is that. Um, when her grandma was young, the amount of spinach that she could eat in a bowl had something like 14 times the amount of nutrition that that same bowl of spinach today has. And it's a massive issue. So that's why the servings have gone up. So that's a lot of food. Um, my wife also likes to say she's not a gorilla. She's not going to eat set 9 to 13 servings a day. So we need to find another way around that. But for those of us that eat that high of serving, a diet high in plants has been proven to protect the body against all forms of disease and mortality. There is a one-to-one -one relationship between high amounts of fruits and vegetables and a higher quality of what? It is a one-to-one -one ratio of all sources of mortality are decreased. That's amazing. So if you're looking to supplement with extra protein into your diet, you probably don't need extra animal, uh, animal products. You sow with plants. That's probably the one aspect that you're going to miss. And plants bring a lot more than just protein. They bring all your vitamins. Uh, all the, the multivitamins that you may be on or know people that are on, fruit, they're designed from fruits and vegetables. If you eat more fruits and vegetables, you don't need those isolates. You don't need those chemicals. You need what's in the plant in whole foods. But it also comes with a lot of antioxidants. So in my practice, there's a few products that I recommend. Uh, this one is the big one. This is called Juice Plus Complete. It's something that makes a lot of sense to me. And everything we talked about tonight, it rolls along directly with it. So what makes it special is that it has soy, chickpea, rice, pea protein sources. It has a one out of one PDCAAS rating. It has low glycemic index, which means it's safe for diabetics. It's not going to uh, rocket your blood sugar up and down. It's gluten-free for anybody that may have allergies to gluten. It's dairy-free, as we talked about dairy is a very inflammatory food. And it's vegan. It's safe for anybody that doesn't want to consume animal products. Furthermore, as I discussed, uh, it's third-party tested. This is NSF certification. Uh, for those of us that follow baseball a little bit, I always listen to this on, on the radio and, uh, when I'm driving to and from work is uh, baseball players are always getting dinged a little bit for what they're consuming. And baseball players, more of anybody, have been at the, the butt end of getting busted with alter, or, uh, performance altering substances. NSF certification is an internationally recognized certification that basically what they do is they come in and they test it randomly, these products on the shelf, and wherever it may be to make sure that they don't have any chemicals they're not supposed to have in it. What they say that what they say on the box is actually inside of it. And they make sure that there's no contamination with heavy metals or other things that could be damaging the person consuming it or just not being the right product, right? So NSF is a really big one. In fact, if you are, in a, or you are a professional athlete or you're an Olympic athlete, NSF is a certification you need to see for anything to be taken in, in the form of supplements. So it's absolutely massive. That's really important to know that. But your health is in your hands. Ultimately, this is your decision. Uh, with protein, it, it can be a bit of an issue when it comes down to choosing what's going to be best for you. My recommendations are go after plants. It's, it's, a, it's an area of growing commonality everybody is kind of finding that fruits and vegetables are the way to go um, if you're if you are vegan or vegetarian there are better uh, better foods that you should be going after that are going to help you along the way and knowing that how much you should take in is very important but more than anything it's quality over quantity and whenever it comes to anything lifestyle or health you want to be making decisions um, that are not all at once right you want to be doing one simple change at a time. So let's say you listen to something tonight and you went, you know what? Yeah, I could make a, I can make a better choice than that. And you decide to make, you don't have to change the whole world. You've got to change one thing at a time. And it's really easy to do. I'm going to add this to my diet or I'm going to change this. But make choices that become healthy habits, things that you can carry on for the rest of your life. Things are going to be long-term goals. And they don't have to be big things, but just little things along the way. And of course, what you put in is what you get out. That is absolutely massive. And know that Bruce Lee said it best. Long-term consistency trumps short-term intensity. And it is very, very true. 
but thank you for, for your time. And I always end my presentations with um, one kind of one kind of thing I always hold my patients to accountable for is that um, there's two types of people on the planet. There's people that hear information, they recognize that there's something they can change in their lifestyles and they make that change. They just out of sheer will, they go, yep, I can be better and they do so. And that's great, we love those people. Unfortunately, they're heavily overshadowed by the next people. The next people are the people that wait for something to happen to them or to somebody they love. And those people are the majority of us. The bad thing about that is that when it comes to health, we're not always given a second chance. And in health, making a change, there's no such thing as too soon, but there is such a thing as too late. So I suggest that if you are thinking about making a decision for you or helping a family member through it, that you make that change immediately. You make it not now, but right now. All right. So thank you very much for your time, everybody.